for our Reaching Complex Students Through Collaborative Distance Education Q&A session, we have Gwen Sermon's parent, Erica McKinney, TVI, Floyd County, Georgia Schools, Christine Spratling, Georgia Sensory Assistance Project, Dr. Deborah Taub, University of Kentucky, and Dr. Jackie Kearns, University of Kentucky. Our moderator is Dr. Wendy Sapp, Bridge Multimedia. I want to thank um, everyone for participating. And we are delighted um, to have heard all that you guys had to share with us. Um, and I want to uh, mention it's been posted in the chat, just pointing out the National Center for Deaf Blindness, which is nationaldb.org, um, is a resource. And there is also a uh, dissertation from last year, 2019, by Yarbrough, um, which is available from the fsu.edu library. Um, you can find that posted in the Q&A box. Uh, so the first question that I see here is really for um, Deborah and Jackie, and it's where can um, where can people find adapted slideshows for literature like the one that you were showing? That's a really good question. We um, at the University of Kentucky, which the Tye Center is at University of Minnesota, we're, we're just contractors for them, but um, um, there is a template for making them. You just, you have to, um, you have to have a copy of the book. You can also use um, a Tar Heel Reader um, because I think they will also project. Um, those are the ones we made, but we just had a template to make them. Um, it's just take a slide and um, make a, and you know, take a slide and um, scan the page of the book and adapt the text. And there you go. And, you know, it's interesting. I wish I had um, known who was going before me because along with our core vocabulary, we have a whole set of tactile symbols that go with our, our core that across the st our state are used. Um, so for, um, um, for, the, for the team that went ahead of us. And we've done a lot of team um, interactive trainings and a lot of team coaching sessions as well. Thank you. Um, the next thing I wanted to ask about, we had a... Um, not a question, but a posting by someone who's training to be an intervener. So um, could any or all of you speak to the role of an intervener during um, COVID-19 when they're not actually one-on-one -on -one with the student uh, because for safety health reasons, they can't be. What are some of the roles that that intervener could take? I'll jump in. <laughs> so the intervener um, works one-on-one -on -one with a student and she has been trained nationally um, through Utah State to be an intervener. And so they learn all the skills to use tactile, how to mo kind of modify for tactile um, delivery of instruction. They have a trusting relationship, which is probably the primary thing of just having some trust. Um, but she works one-on-one -on -one and is with Ivy all day, every day at school. So... I know Erica and Christina have more on that. <laughs> I would say that she's probably the most familiar with some of Ivy's routines and activities. So she's been very beneficial in helping coach through some of the phone calls. This is a huge challenge. How can the interveners uh, support Ivy by distance? Um, it's almost impossible other than giving mom the tools of this is how I do it when I do it. But um, her role has changed 180 degrees. And luckily, I went through the training myself when Ivy was um, two. I started the training. So luckily, I have those skills and probably a little <laughs> more. That, but for this purpose, like with the transitioning to homeschool, I kind of, I have, I have an idea of what's going on. Like we've talked about the biggest issue is when I've sat down with the academic piece with Ivy is being able to, to fill in now, what does Stephanie do? And it's those little small pieces of what are the cue words? What are the cue touches? What are, and so those are the pieces I need to just step into Stephanie's shoes. And a lot of times at school, Stephanie and I have great communication and she has to step into my shoes just as well for the things I do at home that she also has to do at school. And it keeps very, um, the main thing an intervener does is help to keep consistency across the board, whether it's um, um, school activities, whether it's 
going to the restroom, whether it's setting up her feeding because she has a feeding pipe. So it she maintains consistency for Ivy's day while she's at school in any area, not just academics. And in hindsight, if I can say one more thing, is I, I wish we would have videotaped all those routines. I think yes. that's something we just need to learn f- from now on. Anytime you have such specific communication systems, such specific routines, we've got to videotape them so that everybody, that they can be replicated. Christine, I think you're absolutely correct. That's one of the things we um, advise our our communication teams in Kentucky all the time. Please take video clips, show mom, show dad, show siblings, show the next teacher, because when, you know, whenever we have a transition, it goes back to square one sometimes, and we really don't want that to happen. So, um, you know, it's almost a video clip record. We didn't have that 20 years ago when I started teaching, but we have that capacity now, and we really, really, really do need to use it so that when, as a new teacher, I don't do the word, I don't do the word like again, you know, I, I, I know that she knows that. Um, and she has a way to do it. Does that make sense? And we don't repeat the same things over and over. We actually bought an iPad for Ivy at, to use at school, and she carries it from home to school so that there's some consistency there. And we have talked a lot in IEP meetings <laughs> often about um, videoing little segments of of the day, activities, whatever it is, and putting it on there. She has a Google Drive that we can put it, put it all into. And so it's happened a little bit, but it hasn't really taken full form. And this may be the little spur that kicks that off to really open the door for everyone being open to being videoed. Cause that's one of the issues we've run into is not everyone wants to be videoed because they're so afraid of parents <laughs> critiquing. <laughs> so. But that would also be a great a great sharing activity for her too. She can um, share her video with a friend, um, and then they can comment on it. Um, so there, you know, there are lots and lots of not just for um, keeping track purposes, but also for social interaction purposes. See my great video. This is what I did last night, um, and then you fix the words that go around it. That's a great idea. Excellent. And this kind of leads into one of our next questions, and I'm going to expand on the question a little bit. The question said, how do we help SLPs who do not support these students? But I'd expand that to other providers who work with these students. Um, how do we draw in those people who may be having trouble working in a team or working with a student like this? Would anyone care to share some suggestions or success stories? It takes a team, and we've we've been really. Um, Christine may have some some suggestions about that. And sometimes um, SLPs don't feel competent. In fact, um, the, there's pretty good literature out there that says teachers often don't feel competent. SLPs don't feel competent, particularly if they haven't had that kind of experience. Um, so what we're working on in Kentucky is um, training materials for both of those. That doesn't answer your question per se, but inviting them to be a part of the um, conversation is essential and making sure they're a part of the team. And if one SLP doesn't have that competency, somebody in the district will. Um, competency. I don't think any of us learned what to do with these kids when we went to college and still a lot of colleges are struggling because if you've seen one, you've seen one, not one child is like the other. But one, um, there are two things we like to do. One thing is an instrument called Reach for the Stars, which was developed at the University of Kentucky. And it is, a, um, it is an approach where you as a team, including the family, set a common goal, set priority goals. And when this is such a collaborative team um, goal setting approach, I think everybody who's part of that can feel more um, uh, accountability and say, I know how to support that because we have this common goal. So that is one tool, reach for the stars. Another thing we sometimes do um, when I'm asked to, to help a team, because we don't know what to do. I may know my craft or not craft, um, but I don't know how that all fits together, how the puzzle pieces fit together. So we sit down as a team uh, and we talk about how, d- what does everybody bring to the table? What skill do you SLP bring to the table? We all have 
beautiful skills. So what do we bring to the table and what does that look like for this kid? What piece of your skill is necessary or how can we support each other? There's an instrument from um, developer uh, by the national, um, and I cannot talk today, NCDB, National Council on Deaf Blindness that we use, but um, Reach for the Stars and that is um, what we use often. I'll add that um, that one of the things we've been doing at the Thai Center is working with teams to try to build inclusive practices for kids who really fit into these categories of of complex bodies and complex needs. And we, when we started, a lot of the special education teachers, a lot of the specialist art, music, PE, um, and even the speech language pathologist were saying, "I just don't want to mess it up." Like, I don't want to do the wrong thing. I don't want to, I don't want to mess this up. I'm not sure what I can change and what I'm not allowed to change. And, and so part of the process for us was making sure everybody knew that they had permission to try new things and to share that with other people. Because through that process, we were able to really build some new strategies that we hadn't thought, thought of before. And, um, in our case for the speech language pathologist, she ended up coming to the gen ed classes that our students were included in to see what was going on and where she could better support. And it completely changed how she was providing services and and even some of the ways that she was delivering those services. We have two questions around books that I'd like to put to the team. And the first is, are there copyright issues when adapting a book to add board maker picks or adapting it in another way? And then related to that from another participant, where do we find tactile supports for books? Um, you can adapt a book um, as long as you have a copy of the book. And, and you can't there, sell it. <laughs> you can't sell it, but you can adapt a book as long as you have a copy of the book. Um, and, um, you know, so that's, that, I think that's the answer to that question because, because it is an issue of accessibility. Um, so we've, been down that road a few times on on other um, projects. So you can you can if you've got a copy of it, you can adapt it. That's fine. Um, the second question was tactile symbols. Um, the um, um, uh, Kentucky's. Mm, I'm having trouble with words because I'm old. Um, <laughs> um, there's um, tactile connections is a kit. And um, you can, and I don't have any, I don't have any with me to to show it, show you like that. These are 3D symbols, but um, tactile connections is a kit. And those are the ones that our TBI um, experts have helped us with. um, And they are arranged the same way as our core vocabulary. So every symbol stays in the same place always. And every symbol has the same texture, whatever that texture happens to be on it. Um, and that way students, um, and we start sometimes with those, just a single symbol attached to a rocker that says, I want to rock. Or go is attached to the door and, um, or attached also to a voice output device. So, and then we begin to put them in an array slowly. Um, but those are from tactile connections from American Printing House for the Blind. And I would recommend to go to the National um, Center for Deaf Blindness. There are tons of resources because tactile symbols have to be individualized and meaningful. And very often you cannot start with such a symb- highly symbolic one. So it, it involves um, an assessment process. Uh, Charity Rowland and Phil Schweiger. But thank you. Um, also for four words that you book. use a lot. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. You do f- you for nouns, for things that are unique to that individual, they do have to be highly individualized. But for um, core words, which are things like go, want, more, right. um, you can use the same ones. Right. We want to keep it for those, those difficult ones. Co- yes. uh, Project Core um, has a lot of that. Yes. So there are lots of resources out there. And Project Core does the 3D symbols. Um, That's those. Uh-huh. And we also use the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired, but they have a section for deaf blindness um, that kind of gives a good base to start with tactile symbols for a child who's deaf blind and gives you, because we have now elaborated off of that quite extensively, but gave us a good starting board for the, um, the tactiles as well. 
I will just throw in that Gwen worked amazingly hard to come up with wonderful uh, symbols for Ivy for that trip to Disney that you saw the picture from. I'm going to copyright those. (laughs) Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have today. I apologize that we didn't get to all the questions, uh, but a lot of great resources have been posted in the chat by other people. So I hope everyone will check those out as well. So thank you, Gwen and Christine and Erica and Deborah and Jackie. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us.